a good day and i'm i'm really looking forward to uh to spending this time with you uh, i see several of you uh already on and and your hellos and your hearts and i just thank you for uh, for doing that y'all be sure to to speak to brian uh because it just it just really helps my time if, if somebody i know miss sharon will acknowledge him uh but uh, y'all just y'all just love on brian for me because uh sometimes he gets pitiful sitting over there on the other side of the camera but i do thank you for being with us and uh and um and if you have a copy of god's word i want to go ahead and invite you to the text and then we'll have prayer but if you have a copy of god's word in front of you i would love for you to turn with me to matthew chapter 12 uh matthew uh chapter 12 and um and and i'm going to explain all of this in, in just a few moments okay so if you would let's pray together heavenly father you are the alpha and you're the omega you're the beginning and the end and god we just want to thank you tonight for who you are and god we praise you we adore you and we love you at this time god as we look back on this day we see where your hand has been all over our life with that of protection with that of provisions and with that of peace and god thank you heavenly father i truly believe that each one that is listening that is a part of this virtual service and those that will be a little later on or whenever they might view it that god it's for reason and it's for purpose and that reason and that purpose is from you and it is for us so heavenly father my prayer tonight is that we all be obedient during this time heavenly father once again help me to realize that i'm nothing but dirt that you have breathed life in and allow me to be here to be able to stand once again lord my prayer is that i decrease and you increase during our time father will you draw us to you and then move us in the way and the will that you would have us to go. God, thank you for your will tonight. That is always the right path. That is always the right direction for that benefits and blessings that you bestow upon us. Heavenly Father, we lift up the cares and concerns that are on our heart to you right now. Those individuals that are sick, those needing healing, those recovering from surgery and those waiting for surgery the ones that are waiting test results. Father, we pray right now for them physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Heavenly Father, for all of our COVID patients, we lift them up to you right now. Those that we know, but not only them, but also their families, Lord, and the other illnesses and sicknesses that are throughout our friends and throughout our families. Father, we pray and we ask for healing. Heavenly Father, we pray for our country. We pray for our county, our community, and our cities, and our state. Heavenly Father, we pray tonight for revival to sweep through us as individuals and for it to ripple out through our surrounding areas that we, where we serve and the areas that we love. Father, we pray for our upcoming revival here at Soldier Bay of every believer a witness. Heavenly Father, go and anoint now your speaker anoint us dear father and draw us and father bring us to you lord that we may be obedient to the calling of the holy spirit in our life father we will be mindful tonight we will be mindful tomorrow and in the coming days to acknowledge you to serve you and to love you knowing that all good things come from you father we adore and revere you and tonight, we want to tell you once again that we love you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. With your Bible open, I pray that we plug it into heaven tonight and hear from God. I've invited you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. And if you remember last Wednesday night, I began the parable of dealing with the demon-possessed man that Jesus healed and then the the Pharisees and the people and all that went around all that went on around that healing. Tonight I want to share with you the same scripture that I read that night. And then we're going to plug it into a continuation of the parable that more than likely is 
um, sitting right next door to it in your Bible, possibly even on the next page. We saw the, parab the parabolic teaching of Jesus of the man that came and was healed. Just for a real quick 15-second review, we saw the case and we saw the cure. And we saw the conviction of the people. We saw the conviction of the Pharisees. And tonight we will arrive at the conviction of the parable itself in our life. This man was brought to Jesus and the crowds, and the Bible says that the entire crowd, that all the multitudes were amazed. And they asked a question. And they said, could this be the son of David? Well, in the crowd's amazement, it simply aggravated the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, they went to, a, if you remember, they went to a level like none other almost that you ever read in the Bible. And they just kicked the level up a notch and said, no, he's not the son of the devil, not the son of David. He's the son of the devil. He is working under the ruler of the demons of Beelzebub. And all of a sudden, we see Jesus beginning to talk with the Pharisees in this, par in this parable teaching that he gives them. If you remember, I talked with you and I dealt with uh, last Wednesday night looking at and understanding and appreciating the kingdom of God, of knowing that is not some future event, but I truly believe, based upon the word of God, that the kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God is present. I know today that there was a changing of the guards at the White House, just like you know that. You know what? Presidents come and presidents go. But let me share something with you tonight just as a promise from the Bible. Even though there was a change of guard today at the White House, there will never be a changing of guard in the throne of heaven. It is God. It always has been God. And it will continue to be God. And just please understand and take time to, to, to get focused on God and his kingdom and then our calling that we are called to do as Christians. With your Bible open, look with me and read with me, please, Matthew 12, starting in verse 25. And I'm going to read 25 through 30, and then I'm going to verse 43. And the Bible says in verse 25 of Matthew 12, but Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out the demons by the Spirit of God, Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can you enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Now that is Jesus talking about the, the, the binding of Satan himself. And then, he, uh, and, then, uh, and then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Now, please look at verse 43. This is a continuation of the parable. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tie these two together. Y'all okay? I'm going to tie these two together in, in just a few minutes. But watch this. Jesus is going on to, to speak about this parable, about this demon-possessed man. I will tell you for a Bible study nugget that this is the only parable in the Bible that deals with demon possession. I didn't say, obviously, it was the only scripture that deals with demon possession. We're well aware of that. But this is the only parable that Jesus teaches about demon possession. Now look at verse 43. And Jesus went on to say, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first state. And the next verse is some of the saddest words in the Bible, in my opinion. And so shall it also be with this wicked generation. 
please understand linking these two uh, these two separate passages of scripture tonight for this Bible study and parable teaching. Uh, between that, uh, for sake of time, I would love to do it like this. I could talk to you all night about this parable, but I know you probably don't want that. But I, I want to share with you what is going on just as soon as Jesus heals this man, gets in this dialogue with the Pharisees uh, about everything that we talked about last Wednesday night, okay? Uh, there's this conversation. And the Pharisee says, you know what? If you are who you say you are, Jesus, show us a sign. And Jesus begins talking with them about what they're asking for. And he pretty much says, now this is not what Jesus says, okay? This is what Jason says about what Jesus says. Jesus says, it doesn't matter if I show you a sign. You're still not going to believe. He, and he tells him, he says, Jonah, Jonah survived in the, whale, in the, in the, in the great fish, in the whale, is, is what I believe. Jonah survived. And, in, and he preached to Nineveh. And an entire Gentile nation repented. Yet you won't repent. Matter of fact, you're in worse shape than than you're in worse shape than they were because you have received the Messiah and you still won't repent. And he gives them another example. He says the Queen of Sheba. When the Queen of Sheba traveled to hear the wisdom of Solomon, now the Queen of Sheba was from Ethiopia. It is believed that it took her around uh, six months because of the length and the and the and the multitude of her caravan. It took her around six months to arrive uh, to Solomon to sit under his wisdom. And, and Jesus talks about that. He says the queen of the, the the queen of Sheba traveled from the ends of the earth. Pharisees, I've traveled a lot further than she has. I came to you from heaven. And, and, and you're still, you still won't listen to me. You still won't believe. I mean, uh, let, let's stop for just a moment. And, 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 I, and I'm not, don't, don't get mad at me. I mean, I could really see where Jesus could get aggravated. Amen. And, and he basically tell him, you don't need to sign. You need to get saved. You need to repent. The Messiah, the kingdom of God is upon you. So, 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 so look at verse 43. So he's, he's in this dialogue, and he goes back to the demon-possessed man. He goes back to the man that was demon-possessed that he rid him of. Look at verse 43. And the Bible says, Jesus says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Well, now that's a... That, watch this now. This is, this is the parabolic teaching. That's all well and good, isn't it? There was a demon-possessed man, and now he doesn't have a demon in him. So we would immediately think that everything is okay. But is it? Then Jesus turns his attention from the man to the demon. And look what he says about the demon. He says that the demon goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. So he says, I can't find anyone to go into, so I'm going to go back from which I came. So we see here the restlessness of the demon, and we see the reasoning of the demon. Jesus says he can't find any rest. He has nowhere to go. And in that restlessness, there's an out of order. There, uh, any, any, if you think about it, any of you have trouble falling asleep sometimes? It just seems that everything is just out of order, and you can't you can't calm down to to, to drift off to sleep. And, and then there's this reasoning, there's this thinking. Uh, what do I need to do? What can I do? And, and 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 in this reasoning is sometimes out of order. Reasoning sometimes is chaotic, is it not? Are, are y'all okay? Is this making sense? So so everything is out of order. And then he decides, the demon decides to go back to the man from which he came. And when he goes back to the man, what does he find? He finds it's been renovated. And all seems well, doesn't it? But the question is, is it? Look, look what Jesus says. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. The Last night, yesterday evening, I sat down and watched a show with Bethany on Netflix. And the name of the show, I don't know if any of you watch it or not. Maybe maybe you'll comment, and I'll glance at your comments later. But the name of the show is Home Edit. 
It's these two women, and they go inside the house, and if you've got a kitchen or if you've got a cupboard or, or a, a, a closet or a bathroom or something, they'll go in there, and everything, obviously, if they've been called to your house, everything's out of order, right? So they're going to come in, and they're going to help organize it and get it all pretty and get it all colorful, and nothing wrong with that, okay? I'm not knocking it, but here's what I am knocking. I have never heard this particular episode that I watched. They went, I don't know why I'm sharing this with you, but they went to this cupboard. They went to this kitchen cupboard. This woman wanted her cupboard done. And I have never heard so much conversation about a clear canister that Cyril goes in. I mean, they were all excited. They were right giddy. I mean, they, I mean, and, and then they had the big reveal. You know, they had the woman come in and they opened the door and there she saw it and she squealed and she was all excited. And I looked at me, I said, this is ridiculous. I said, I ain't never been that excited over my cupboard. I guess I need to get it organized. But usually this organization is not a bad thing. I mean, obviously it makes people happy. It makes me, nothing wrong with being organized, okay? Nothing wrong with that. But let's get back to the parable. A lot of times with organization, or if you allow me, this renovating that has happened, it's always for the better. Now, spiritually speaking, this particular renovating is not better. Jesus said it's actually worse. Even though, some, look, something may be better, but that don't mean there's spiritual benefits. One thing I'm really trying hard to work on in my life is saying no to the good things so I can say yes to the better things that God has for me. Does that make sense? Even though something sounds good, with God, there's always better things. There's always greater things. And that's what I want to be obedient in doing. What, what, this, what this parable shows us is that this demon-possessed man went through reformation. Nothing wrong with reformation. Nothing wrong with that. But listen. Just because you tidy up, just because you quit something, doesn't mean everything is good and everything is okay. And just because you stop doing something, doesn't mean you're a Christian. Nothing wrong with Reformation, but spiritually speaking, if there was some way tomorrow you could go through the entire day and not sin. Not sinning does not make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So reformation is not spiritually beneficial. We don't sometimes we just well, I quit something. Well, well, that's good. But what about your relationship with Jesus Christ? Now look at verse 45. The Bible says, talking about the demon, Jesus says, then he goes, talking about the demon, then he goes and takes with him seven, uh, seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. So this demon leaves and he goes and gets his buddies. And the Bible tells us that he's more, that they are more wicked than he is. So one thing that jumped out to me, I don't even know what time it is, but it's okay. Uh, one thing that's that one thing that's that, that's interesting to me is to me, Jesus is showing us here, and I don't really know a good word to say here, so I'm going to say it to the best of my ability. Jesus shows here that there's different levels of demons. Not, I don't want to give him any credit, but it's almost like a hierarchy. It's almost like they specialize in certain things. Now, if you've got something to write with and you, and, and, and you want to write this down, I'm going to give you some Bible, I'm going to give you some scripture with some Bible study nuggets of what I'm talking about. The very first thing that I want to show you that in the Word of God, we have that of seducing and false spirits. Those spirits, each spirit that I'm going to give you is specifically named in the scripture. Now, 
the seducing and false spirits, they they have one motive, and that motive is simply to, to, to go about teaching false doctrines. And in 2 Corinthians 11.4, I'm going to be right here, okay? In 2 Corinthians 11.4, look what the Bible says. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Okay, now understand, so I want to say this disclaimer real fast. I'm not going to do a Bible study on each one of these scriptures. I'll encourage you to go back and read it in context, okay? What I am showing you are the different levels or the different, um, the different types of characteristics of, of the spirits, okay? So we see that of seducing and false spirits. And then there's the unclean and evil spirits. And their motive in Scripture, we find that the unclean and evil spirits cause physical suffering. Look at Matthew 10.1. Matthew 10.1, the Bible says, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, meaning and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. Now, there's two other passages. That's Luke 7.21 and Acts 5. 16, and then Acts 8, 7, okay? So I want to give you that there, all right? So we have the unclean and evil spirits in Scripture. They'll cause the physical suffering. And then there's the miracle-working spirits, the miracle-working demonic spirits. And in Revelation 16, 13, 14, Revelation 16, 13, 14, what is their, what is their motive? Well, it's in the name. They're imitating the work of God. John said in Revelation, he, in Revelation, he said, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So we have the, the, the miracle working spirits. And then we have what the Bible calls the foul spirits. And Revelations 18, 2, 3. Well, what is their motive? The foul spirit's motive is that of sexual immorality. Look at John again, what he says in Revelations 18. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. We have that of the foul spirits. And then we have that of the violent spirits. Well, what's their motive? Once again, it's in the name. They're going to cause violence. Acts 19, 12. This may be a little hard for you to see. So, so Acts 19, 12, 16. Acts 19, 12, 16. And, and, and Luke says in Acts 19, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. No, 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 watch this. And the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by, G by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now watch the conversation. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know. And Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And then there's that of the lying spirits. What is their motive? You guessed it. That of lying, not being truthful. And we, in 1 Kings 22, 22, 23, 1 Kings 22, 22, 22, y'all okay? 22, 22, 23. Now look at this. The Bible says the Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And the Lord says, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, 
The Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. And then I believe there's that of the spirit of unbelief. And that's what the Pharisees are dealing with here. Now we have to understand, you remember Numbers chapter 13 and 14? In Numbers 13 and, and, and Numbers thir chapter 13 and chapter 14, we have Israel and Moses and Joshua and Caleb and Aaron. We have them at Kadesh Barnea. And it's the famous story where, G where God tells them to go into the land of Cana and spy. Now, this is going to be a cliff note version, okay? To go in there and spy. And it was at this point that I truly believe that began the plague of unbelief with several of the Israelites. They go over there to Cana, sent the 12 spies, they come back and they report of those being giants and us being and them being grasshoppers. And they start poor mouthing. They start finding fault with God. And they even started saying, why don't we just go back to Egypt? Why in the world has God brought us all the way? You know the story. Why has God brought us all the way here for us to die? They got so irritated, they got so aggravated that they wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb. And then you begin what I call the biblical narrative through the Bible. And throughout the Old Testament, you have the, the godly kings that would rip the idols down. And you had the ungodly kings that would come in right behind them and set the idols right back up. And unbelief has taken its toll. And John the Baptist comes on the scene. And many repent. We're dealing with that on Sunday mornings, right? Many repent. Jesus comes on the scene. And many repent. And many start following. But in all of that, I'm closing. I know you like those words. In all of that, still there's the spirit of unbelief. Because you see, the Pharisees, the, religious, the Jewish religious leaders, there would come a time very soon that they would officially reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They'd have him arrested. They'd have him killed. They'd have the mock trials. They would officially reject Jesus Christ. So you see, it would be making that last state far worse than the first state. And it's the same today. Are you with me? It is the same today. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean by that, Jason? A lot of times we a lot of times people will get busy about quitting things and getting things in order. Now, if you, if you do New Year's resolutions, God bless you. I'm thankful, I'm thankful for you. But if you did a New Year's resolution, are you still being obedient to that resolution on January the 20th? See, we put all of our attention on stuff like that sometimes. See, we just concentrate on the, we just concentrate on the renovating. But there's a word, there's one word in this parable that jumps out at me. And it's in verse 44. How did the demon find the house? How did he find the man? The Bible says, and when he comes, he finds it empty. He finds it empty. The demon was there. And then he was gone. And it's empty. There's been, the, there's been the reformation. But what about that regeneration? What about that relationship with Jesus Christ? What about that? You see, Jesus hadn't taken up residence in his life. 
Will you do me a small favor? Will you take your Will you take your Bible, and you turn with me, pretty please, to Psalm eighteen, Psalm eighteen one eight. I want to show you something really, really fast. Are, are y'all still with me? In Psalm eighteen, it's the Psalm of David. He's praising God for his protections and his provision uh, uh, of that of keeping him safe, keeping him alive from that of Saul. Psalm 18, are you there? I want you to listen to the very first three verses. That's all I'm going to read. The very first three verses of Psalm 18. David says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. In Psalm 18, look at all what David said God was in just three verses. He said, he is my strength. He is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. He repeats, he is my strength. He is my shield, my horn of salvation, my stronghold. Can I ask you a real question real quick? Is God all of that to you? I, I, my prayer is tonight that we, we don't find ourselves empty. But my, my prayer is that, man, Jesus is in every room of our house. Amen. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? He is in every room of our house. He is in every aspect of our life. And I'm going to tell you something. When God is your strength and your rock and your fortress and your stronghold and your horn of salvation and your shield, guess what? Get, hey, when he's taking up mu that much room, guess who doesn't have any room to get in there? Paul said in Ephesians 3.19, And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of, of God. Are you filled tonight? My prayer is we're not serving, we're not loving empty, but that we're full of God tonight. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, God, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for being our strength, for our rock, our fortress, our deliverer. Heavenly Father, thank you for being our shield, our horn of salvation. Thank you for being our Masada, God. And God, I pray right now through the power of the Holy Spirit, Father, that you just begin to convict us and change us and move us to where we need, dear Lord. God, may we, may, we not, may we not log off Facebook. May we not log off YouTube or virtually whatever. Father God, may we not do it tonight feeling empty, but being drawn to you, Lord, with only that of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, if any other spirit is in our life right now, if any other spirit is in our homes right now, is in our church office right now, Father, we ask them to dismiss right now under the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Father, at the mention of his name, they will flee. So, Father God, we thank you tonight for your promises and your love. And God, thank you for saving us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you. You ready? Say it like you believe it. God is good, and all the time. Amen. God bless you, and be safe.